This is the history of forensic science part two. In this part, we're going to talk about the people that are historically significant to the development of forensic science. The first person we're going to talk about is Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who was a popular author in the late 1800s. His most popular series involved a character called Sherlock Holmes, who was a fictional uh, crime-solving detective. Sherlock Holmes was important because his cases were solved based on deduction, inference, and observation. This fictional character was based on his university professor, Joseph Bell, who was a renowned diagnostician. His character is probably, or Joseph Bell is probably similar to what we would think of today as Dr. House from our modern TV show. Next we have Matthew Orfila. He was considered, or is considered, the father of toxicology. He published his book on poisons in 1813. Now in this book, he writes about how to detect poisons, their effects on animals, and he specifically focuses on arsenic. Now, he writes this book because at, the, at that time, that was the preferred method to murder someone you didn't like because they didn't have methods to detect these poisons. These deaths were often thought of as caused by natural causes. Now, one of the first instances uh, where a scientific professional testifies in court is actually by Matthew Orfila testifying about whether someone could have been poisoned by natural uh, causes. Next, we have Alphonse Bertillon. Now, I talked earlier about the Bertillon method. This is the guy who developed that method. He is considered the father of anthropometry. Anthro meaning human, metry meaning measure. Anthropometry was kind of popularized in 1879, and this was a system that used, I believe it's 11 measurements, that, um, to distinguish one individual person from another, and they based this on different actual body measurements. Now, his method was used for a long time. However, it was disproven when two convicts with identical measurements and names were found inside the Leavenworth prison. Now, the only way those two identical men could be distinguished was through fingerprints. This case is called the Will or William West case. Now, what happened is William West shows up at Leavenworth prison. They take his measurements. They put it in the records, and they say, wait a second, you're already here. They then find out that Will West has identical measurements to William, and they're both in the same system. What they were able to figure out is that their fingerprints were different. This caused the Bertillon method to fall out of use and fingerprints to be the main method of identification from this point on. Now, just an interesting fact, these men may have been related. It was common to keep the last name of your father, even if your father wasn't in the picture. It was also common to be named after your father, which is interesting because they both have the name William. You can see actually in the bottom of the slide, those are two different men, even though they look very similar. Now, Sir Francis Galton is considered the father of fingerprinting. He was actually the nephew of Charles Darwin. He developed fingerprinting as a way to uniquely identify individuals. He was the one who basically described all the different types of fingerprints and wrote a book about how to differentiate between those different types. And make sure you don't confuse him with Sir Edward Henry, who took those methods of classifying fingerprints and then created a system so that we could make, a, make files based on how do you classify those people. Now, Leon Ladies is important because he built on the work of Carl Landsteiner. Carl Landsteiner was the one who developed the A, B, A, B, and O blood groups. Ladies was a Italian scientist who devised a procedure where you could take dried blood stains that were thought up until then to have been unusable and actually kind of rehydrate them to be able to pick out the A, the B, the A, B, and the O blood from that dried blood. This method was really important because up until then you had to get to a crime scene when the blood was still wet to actually be able to use that as evidence. His procedure is still used today by some forensic scientists. We're going to talk about Calvin Goddard a lot more, more when we get to our ballistics unit. The Calvin Goddard is considered the father of ballistics. Not only is he the father of ballistics who popularized the way that we now actually match and identify our ballistic information, he created and actually uh, you popularized the use of what's called the comparison microscope. This is actually where you have two microscopes that kind of are linked together so that you can actually compare two items under microscopic view. 
Albert Osborne is another individual. He's considered the father of document examination or question documents. Now, question documents is a field of forensic science that focuses on identifying forgeries, counterfeiting, and things like that. His work led to the acceptance of question documents as scientific evidence in a court of law. Now, J. Edgar Hoover, you might know of him based on the Hoover movie with Leonardo DiCaprio that came out recently. He is the father of our Federal Bureau of Investigation. He became the director of the FBI during the 1930s. His leadership spanned 48 years, eight presidents. Um, his reign covered Prohibition, the Great Depression, World War II, Korea, Cold War, Vietnam, you name it, he did it. Now, what he's most known for and how he helped the field of forensic science is because he organized a national laboratory to offer forensic sciences, sciences to any law enforcement agency in the U.S. From this, we have our five, five main branches of forensic science and main laboratories that currently exist in the United States. Edmund Locard is probably the most well-known person that you need to know in this class. He's considered the father of the crime lab, and he created something called Locard's Exchange Principle. In 1910, he actually started the first crime lab in the attic of a nearby police station. He had very few tools, but he quickly became known um, as a premier forensic scientist and criminal investigator, and he eventually founded the Institute of Criminalists in France. Now, one case that he actually popularized and testified in court about was three different individuals who were accused of counterfeiting. He was actually able to look at trace evidence and link them back to the specific metals that was used to create the counterfeit coins. He found microscopic traces of those on the individual that was the one doing the counterfeiting. Now, what exactly is Locard's exchange principle and why is it important? Now, Locard's exchange principle states that every contact leaves a trace. And Locard believed that every criminal could be connected to a crime by particles or trace evidence that was carried from the crime scene. It states that when a criminal comes in contact with an object or a person, a cross transfer of that evidence occurs. And when you can find that transfer of evidence, you can actually find evidence to convict a person and maybe even refute a testimony or uh, even support an alibi. Now, those are all the people you need to know. Just a little bit about how crime scene investigators have changed over time. Now, historically, the first kind of investigators that would actually show up and try and solve crimes at the scene were detectives that typically had very small kits that they carried around in their car. After that came investigators. Now, these investigators weren't our investigators today. These investigators only specialized in one area. So they would come out and they would specifically take one type of evidence and oftentimes would leave other evidence that today we would think of as being important. After this, we get the development of something called a criminalist. Now, criminalists are trained in all areas of forensics, but they typically specialize in one area. After this, we have a little bit of a step backwards with the development of evidence technicians. Evidence technicians are good because they are less expensive. They're not, they don't have to go through the training that a criminalist does, which can be expensive. However, um, their job is to go out and collect evidence as seen. Now, because they don't have that training, they don't really have the context of what is important evidence and what should actually be collected. So a lot of times you end up with a lot of evidence being collected and being taken back to the lab to be processed that might have nothing to do with the actual crime that was committed or it might not even have been in the same room. Now, today we have crime scene investigators or detectives that have special training on crime scene investigation. They're charged with not only investigating the scene and following leads, but also collecting evidence. Their job is to link the scene to the evidence and determine the probative value of that evidence. Now, probative actually means to prove something. So this evidence directly proves something related to the case. I hope you enjoyed your first uh, video lesson.